to introduce Jen Mankoff. I'll keep it uh, brief. So Jen is joining us today from the University of Washington, where she has relatively newly arrived. Um, she is the Richard E. Gladner Professor in the School of Computing and Engineering there. Um, Jen has held professor uh, positions at other wonderful places, such as Berkeley and CMU. Um, Jen is a powerhouse in assistive technology, where we learn more about assistive technology, and part of the uh, assets community, and I'm a member of as well, and definitely also of the, the SIG Chi community, serving on the Chi Steering Committee, um, and a uh, long standing member at the Chi Conference um, with Best Paper Awards, and so on and so forth. Um, she's also a Sloan Fellowship, of an IBM Fellowship, and a number of other wonderful accolades. Her current focus is in terms of assistive technology is on 3D printables and applying them to make a more inclusive society. With that. Thank you very much. I'm impressed, especially that you memorized all that. <laughs> I hope it didn't take space from something more important, though. <laughs> We're delighted. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Um, and uh, really excited. I haven't actually been to UBC before, so it's neat to have a chance to be here. So thank you for oh, having me. Many <laughs> yeah, especially now that I'm so close, right? <laughs> Good. Um, so, I am going to be talking about fabrication and accessibility today, and I want to start by trying this out, and it's not working, okay, that's good, I'm right here. <laughs> so this is a video that um, actually a friend of mine told me that you should always start a good talk with a story, and it was my first really good job talk because it worked, so <laughs> here we go with it here as well. This is um, actually a friend of my daughter's in Pittsburgh, and also a cellist, and as you can tell, he plays beautifully. Maybe it's not loud enough, but I also want to talk over it, so that's okay. Um, and uh, what you might not notice if you're not a cellist is that he's actually playing this cello in reverse because he only has fingers on one hand. He has two fingers on his uh, fingering hand. Um, and he has uh, an arm that ends about here on the other side. And so he's actually using this device here to um, hold his cello bow. And we're, we'll call it the gauntlet. And this was uh, based on a creation of a community called Enable, which has been in the news a lot because it's been growing exponentially. It's uh, a phenomenon worldwide right now for 3D printing hands, mostly for kids, in the US mostly themed after superheroes, um, and getting in the news a lot for this. Um, and the, the Enable volunteers, Drew Murray and Stephen Davies, created much of what you're seeing here, and then we modified it to hold the cello bow. And this story about Enable and about how it's helping to make something possible for this child is a story that has sold really well in the media. And that also, I think, illustrates a space in which 3D printing is very compelling. And so compelling, in fact, that you see a lot of people volunteering to help Enable because they suddenly know what they can do with their 3D printers that they bought and used twice, right? <laughs> um, and it also represents a possible this is his recital, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's, it represents an opportunity maybe for a change in the economy, right? Consumer grade manufacturing. Um, what does it mean to be able to create custom devices at will? Um, but from a computational perspective, there's a lot of open questions here still. And also, I would say from an HCI perspective. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time in this talk trying to highlight some of the gaps and some of the um, problems that are hidden beneath that story that I just told that sounds so wonderful. Because there's a lot of issues with that story that are, um, I think, getting in the way of uh, real success in this domain. But I want to start with a little bit of history, because in the assistive technology domain, the idea of creating things has been around for decades, probably millennia, right? And there's whole books of this, it's very common that somebody who has a specific disability, either themselves or with the help of a family member or a friend, is creating solutions for themselves. Um, and not only in the historical sense, but if you look on a place like Thingiverse, you'll see a wide variety of assistive technologies. Thingiverse is a social network for people to share 3D printable models and other kinds of um, CAD models. 
that can be made. Um, so it's happening already that assistive technology is being created by end users, and they're doing it in ways that use manufacturing technologies at least some of the time. Um, and there's lots of categories of designs in which this is <coughs> happening, that, and it's actually one of the most compelling uses of 3D printers even outside of the enable phenomenon, because if you look on Thingiverse, what you'll see is a lot of figurines and other things that don't have to interact with the real world. And it's when people are compelled by problems like this that they're starting to really think about, well, how do I make something that can encase something else or hold something else or help me control something else? And those are really interesting spaces, not only for mechanical design, but especially for HCI to support. So digging further into this, we did some studies um, looking at who is making assistive technology um, and how they're making it, especially when it comes to using fabrication technologies. So I'm kind of using fabrication and manufacturing interchangeably here, but most of what I'm gonna talk about is focused on 3D printing in particular. Um, so what we see is this ecosystem, and I've already alluded to this in the sense that, you know, it's the person with the disability and maybe family members and friends and also, of course, clinicians. And if you look to talk to OTs, uh, occupational therapists and physical therapists, they identify as makers often because they are doing this kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, groups like Enable, and if we actually did, as part of building this BOAM, our case study with three different people who each had very different ecosystems that they were drawing from in order to solve their particular problems. Um, so that's the space that this technology is coming into, and we are studying and asking questions about how it supports and changes the practices of like, all of these different kinds of stakeholders. And one of the things that becomes clear when you start to look at this from the perspective of different stakeholders is that we can start to see, oh, PowerPoint messed up my image. <laughs> it's tiny. I don't know how that happened. That's an enable hand, sort of like the bow one, but it's Trump's. got articulated fingers. What's that? Donald Trump's. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, so what, what you see here is an argument between the clinicians, even those who are trying to support the enable community and the enablers. And what you see on, on this side, also a little bit blurry, maybe it's less blurry if you're further away than me, is a, a very high-end <coughs> bike riding custom prosthetic. <coughs> Somewhat custom, right? Prosthetics in the medical community that are this advanced are typically meant to be made once and used by many people because the cost structure doesn't support uniqueness very well, right? Um, that's not universally true, but often the case. But this is for a, right, somebody who's racing a bike. It's built, has built-in safety mechanisms, quick release, right? All of the things that you need to do this properly. And it epitomizes the do no harm perspective that is inherent in the medical system. What you see here is a hand that was designed by Enable. It does have articulated fingers, but it's made of plastic. It has not been tested for how long it's gonna last. It has no specific quick release. It doesn't have a great grasp. And it is probably going to result in an accident, which would probably happen anyway, because this kid is probably learning to ride a bike for the first time. And I don't know how many of you have taught kids to ride a bike, but we celebrated the first bike blood that my kids had. We called it bike blood, we gave it a name, we looked forward to it because it was part of the process, right? And so what you're doing here is what you might call help where you can, um, and it's okay that it's imperfect, but it's, it's, it's uh, such a divide that, it, that help where you can versus do no harm that clinicians can't even produce these things in a way that's comfortable for them, and enablers can't really help influence the clinical practice very much if that's the level that they're operating at. Right, so this is a, a real challenge and a struggle for these two communities to benefit and learn from each other. Um, and these really represent core values. Um, not only that, but there are really interesting differences in the clinical approach from how the enable approach or even an HCI approach would consider this. So. Um, if you do user-centered design, you probably think of iteration as a core value. Um, but in the study that we did that um, looks like it's gonna be in CHI next year, where we worked with clinicians, they considered iteration to be a failure because of the time it was wasting 
in their client's experience of having a problem solved. And not just time, but potentially injury, because if somebody comes in with an injury that's getting worse, and you give them something that doesn't work, and it's another month before they come in again, that's, that's like furthering the injury, right? And so um, what we ended up developing in this clinical context were, um, among other things, uh, solutions that you could almost think of as prescribable, that you could tweak in the moment when somebody was coming in for the solution but didn't have to revise, that could be modified slightly based on something like hand size measurements but not have to be redone from scratch in order to function properly. So that's a, a, it was an interesting observation about what would a tool need to be like that supporting a clinician is kind of different than what you might think about in a more human-centered design context. Um, so I'm highlighting these things just because I think that I'm going to go on a tangent for just a second. But if you've ever been to an art museum, have you ever noticed how few pictures have shadows? And it kind of bugs me, right? Because you're leaving something really important out of the picture when you don't bother to draw the shadows. But shadows are hard, and they're easy to overlook. And I think in HCI, our shadows are, are like multiple stakeholders, right? So we, we often focus on one stakeholder to the exclusion of others that are relevant to a problem we're solving. And then we miss really important pieces of how to solve the problem. So I, I, just, I think it's really important to just be aware of this range of stakeholders and the different needs that they bring. And that's why I wanted to have this piece of the talk, even though a lot of what I'm going to talk about from here on out is really more about the consumer side of things. OK, so, so now focusing more again on the consumer side, um, what I want to focus most of the talk on is how can we improve this process, and how can we build tools that can improve this process? Um, because the um, enable user verse may seem obviously better to somebody who's embedded in the HCI view of the world. But the difficulty of realizing this vision of actually creating a device, customizing it, which is a smaller component of the enable community than those who can just print what already exists, and doing the, in the case of enable, potentially iterative design, or at least user-centered work of like the needs gathering and the follow-up, is not an easy thing to support and not something that is inherently present in the current Enable community, which hands models to people who have 3D printers in their basement and doesn't necessarily provide all of the context for how those should be used or modified. So um, what I want to focus on today, then, is how can we help people to make better AT and maybe customize it? And also, how can we enhance the process to include better follow-up? Um, so that we can start to see that loop being closed a little better. And I'm going to argue that one of the, I'm, I'm now going a little bit away from the practical stuff I've been talking about, more into research, and say that there's a lot of things we'd like to pick and fix about AT, right? And some of it is maybe further away than just changing the models. Let's change the materials. So this is a 3D printer that is designed to print using layers of cloth. And this rabbit here is an example of something that came out of it. And so, you know, aside from glasses, some of which are made of metal, some of which are made of plastic, most of what we wear is not plastic, right? And so thinking about how do we make comfortable augmentations for the human body requires considering alternative materials. And there's um, lots of ways we can do that. So this is from a project where we were working to make machine knitting machines easier to program so that you can start to create custom devices on them more easily. Um, this last video is, let's see if I can pause this other one, is about using off-the-shelf consumer-grade 3D printers to put layers of cloth into the other print pieces of the print job in order to create both effects that soft materials enable, like hinges, um, mixed materials and also be able to create things that might be more about the cloth and less about the plastic. Um, you can also create things that are larger than the print bed this way, so there's lots of ways that you can leverage this capability. And I should mention that all of this work depends on lots of wonderful, wonderful collaborators, so I've tried to highlight usually the main student on the project, sometimes the other faculty. Um, so I think there's a lot of open problems when it comes to materials. Um, 
you know, cloth is a good starting place, but I think there's lots of other materials out there that we could consider. Um, trying to develop solutions that are more accessible to consumers is really important here. Um, and then there's just so many open questions now that we have the capability to create things with these new materials. What do we do with that, right? What are the places where we need to start innovating in order to make these truly flexible and capable of letting us do all of the things that could be possible with them? So that's just sort of a touching point for thinking about um, additional work in the material space. Um, I'm now going to focus in on the design space. And actually, before I switch gears completely, I just want to say it's OK to ask questions if you have them, because I'm covering a lot of different material in this talk. So if you have things you want to ask about, just raise your hand. Um, OK, so in the design space, um, I think there's actually a, a set of things that are difficult. And in fact, I think that an important research agenda here is trying to figure out what's difficult, right? Because we have a space which is now kind of like end-user programming. There's all sorts of things that might trip people up, and we don't necessarily understand all of them completely. And so the first project I'm going to talk about is exactly about that. Um, so this is actually referring back to the um, case study I mentioned at the beginning of the talk when we were making the cello bow holder. We realized that one of the things that was really hard about making a cello bow holder was figuring out how long it should be. Because it turns out that when you play the cello, you really want to have your shoulders square and your bow at a certain place on the strings in order to get the best sound. But there's nothing you can measure that easily will tell you if that is exactly right. And so what we ended up doing was using Legos to play with the length of the cello bow holder that we created for Wilbur in order to be able to let him actually try playing it with different lengths and figure out what worked for him. Because there were some trade-offs between control and how far it was from his limb, residual limb and shoulders and other things like that, right? Um, and so we started to wonder, well, is measurement one of those things that might be hard? And so we actually uh, decided to do a mechanical Turk study on how people measure. And we asked people in the study to measure objects that we knew their size, like an iPhone. And we asked them to measure them at least two ways each and to take a picture and then write down the measurement. Um, and what we found was an incredible array of ways in which people could get measurement wrong. right? And, and by enough that if you were, say, making an iPhone case, your phone would fall out. <laughs> so significant issues. So here's an example. Um, this is just simply using the kind of the wrong measurement device. So this is a piece of measuring tape that's useful for sewing, if you don't recognize it. And it's soft. It's like flexible, right? And also, they're often folded up. And so what you see here in this shadow, what this is, is like a little bend in, in the tape caused by the memory of it being folded up. And it hasn't been flattened out properly. So the measurement's going to be wrong because it's doing this instead of going straight across the phone, right? Um, another thing that's difficult about measurement is sometimes <coughs> the thing you're measuring is not easy to measure because there's a curve or something else getting in the way, right? Um, and there could also be uh, design problems with the measurement. So we asked them to measure the diameter of the base of this bulb, but it has threads. Are you measuring the outer diameter or the inner diameter, right? And so that's sort of an ill-defined measurement problem. And if you think these are problematic, I'll just ask you to imagine what happened when people had to use a protractor. <laughs> we asked them to measure how wide open their laptops were. And you know, a lot of people didn't even remember what a protractor was as far as we could tell, right? So we got a wide range of ideas about how one might measure that. Um, and so my um, thesis in, back in a long time ago <laughs> was about recognition-based systems. And one of the things that was sort of a core principle in my PhD thesis was this idea that we can only assume a certain level of accuracy in these systems. And whatever they get to, there's going to be errors. And then you have to think about how to recover from those errors. If it's 99% accurate and you're looking at 100 words, there's still going to be an error, right? And it turns out that the time it takes to correct those errors is a big part of what's difficult about using recognition-based systems. Starting to improve, but I would say that like still now, if I dictate to my phone, I spend at least as much time correcting the one or two errors that happen in the dictation as I do giving the dictation, right? Similarly, I don't think these errors are going to go away, right? We could try to create better instructions and better information to people, give better information to people about how to measure or maybe even create better measurement tools, but you're going to see these kinds of errors. And so the question we started to ask ourselves was, 
if we're thinking about consumers who are doing 3D design, what can we do to help them build things that are uh, able to recover from errors without having to redo the design over and over and over again? And so we played around with different kinds of things, like that's a flexible buffer made out of nylon. So if you have the diameter slightly wrong, you can still stick your thing in and it'll work. You know? Or you could imagine that you design something where the, the piece that is most likely to have to be adjusted is detachable. And then you can just reprint just that bit of it over and over again until you get it the way you want. And then maybe glue it in. Or maybe once you have that final measurement, then print something that's a single piece. right? Or maybe you want something where you don't know the angle. And so you just make it so you can change the angle. And that's part of the design. And so we played around with this design space as a way of creating something that could uh, support people even when they don't measure accurately. So that's just one issue, measurement, right? And so I, one of the things I'll challenge you to do is to think about what are all of the other places in the 3D modeling and printing space where a similar process might help us uncover ways in which tools could better support people who want to do this and don't have the expertise or the resources of somebody who has the kind of background that a typical CAD modeler might have. Um, so another one is attachment, right? And we've played around with tools that can sort of capture common methods of attachment. So printing through an object in order to attach a label to it, or printing on it, or creating something that you can then glue on. And can you use a tool to sort of help visualize to people what are good attachment places, um, help them improve the quality of the attachment, or pick among techniques? good questions to ask, right? And as soon as you're building things that have to interact with the real world, some kind of attachment, either permanent or temporary, is likely to be a part of what you have to design for. Yes? Isn't one aspect of the measurement problem also what the measurements end up <coughs> getting used for? So off-the-shelf clothing, <coughs> excuse me, if you buy two shirts or two pairs of pants from nominally the, the same batch, they could be quite different in size than what I have been led to understand is it's because they use laser cutters, they stack a whole bunch of material up, cut it all at once, and so it gets cut essentially at an angle. And so even though all the pieces were precision cut with the laser supposedly to exactly the same uh, huh. measurement, depending where they were in the stack, they're different, and therefore you get variations which seem to be almost a whole size by the time you're done. That's a really great example. And I think the same is true if you're using something like a 3D printer, because you might think you have it right, but then the material that you're using maybe shrinks or expands a little bit depending on how you manufactured it, right? Um, and I think that the same kinds of techniques that we showed that are accommodating for human error could potentially also help accommodate those kinds of errors as well. Um, and one of the things I, I didn't mention that I think is important in that space is also thinking about what can you characterize the range that the error is likely to fall into? Because the technique you need to use is going to differ a lot if you're talking about a whole size than a few millimeters, potentially, right? Um, so I think there's a, a lot of work still to be done in that space. Um, I, I, you know, I've been working on these problems now for several years, but I, I feel like the number of, of uh, things that need to be done still is just endless and exciting, right, from a research perspective. <laughs> um, OK. so. Um, Another thing that we've played around with is adaptation. And so the, the question here is, um, we went and did a survey of existing assistive technologies and looked at the kinds of things that they were doing for people, right? So the ability to slide something, or add a lever to something, or um, create something that is more easy to hold, all represent different kinds of moves in, in, in making something more accessible. And it turns out that you know, the, the number of different things that you might want to put a buffer around in order to make it easier to grasp or add a lever to, the, the variety there isn't that large. And so if we, can ha if we have a model of the thing that needs to be adapted and somebody can tell us which of those kinds of adaptations they want, it's not hard to actually generate, automatically generate solutions that can help with that. And so this project was about developing a tool that could actually reproduce a wide variety of existing accessibility solutions and also apply them to new objects. Um, so that's kind of taking the measurement attachment stuff to the next level of, at the application level, how can we use those? Um, 
And then the last thing that I'm going to talk in more depth about than these others is reuse. Um, and really, um, what I mean by reuse is starting to think about this not only from an end user programming perspective, but really from a software engineering perspective. So we kind of take it for granted that when we want to, in fact, it almost seems unfortunate when I talk to new programming students today, because instead of learning languages, they're learning libraries, right? <laughs> Um, and so this idea that you can take a set of capabilities, pull it down, check the API, and use them is an inherent part of programming practice today. But when you look at 3D modeling, you have to be a real expert to even find the places and the tools that let you use some of those capabilities. And it's not that easy to extend the set of capabilities that are out there or add them if you are an amateur. And so we started playing around with this concept of, well, what would a a CAD program look like that sort of as its core value included software engineering principles around modularity. And we extended Fusion 360, which is a popular free CADing program, with, uh, uh, and has a Python-based scripting language, and we added to it the concept of object-oriented models that could pair geometry and coding logic. And the first two things we added were assertion checking and support for integration. And I'll explain what those mean. And then we used the surveys we had done of existing technologies and CAD models and things like that to develop a library of, of things that we thought would be helpful to people um, and a GUI for creating parts. So let me give in a scenario first, and then I'll explain what's going on here. So in our library, there are specific kinds of things, like a, you know high-level things like an adjustable cup holder or low-level things like a bolt or a nut bolt assembly. And you can pick one of these and enter parameter values for it and then it will show up in Fusion 360. Now, one of the really important things here that you'll see is that our models don't just include the thing that is to be manufactured, they also include um, CAD data that represents other information about the model. So here, this is a pipe clamp, and this green thing is a model of the pipe. So you're never gonna manufacture the pipe, but that gives us information. It essentially represents an assertion that says, there's something here that can't be impeded in any way by any changes you make to this model. And we're gonna throw an error, a visual error, that you can immediately see if you accidentally do something that impedes that. And I'll show an example of that in a second. This is a cup holder, and you can see the buffer idea for the measurement study in here. Um, and so if somebody wants to combine these, and they do it in such a way that the cup and the pipe are intersecting, our assertions will highlight that as a problem. And so then they can rearrange how they're combined. And now they have a functional solution for a cup holder that attaches to their bike, if that's what they want to do, <coughs> right? And then you can invoke integration, which says, OK, now combine these into something that's actually printable. And the, the integration logic knows, like, I should cut a hole here. Or this is something that I should join together. And it can even include. Um, uh, geometry that doesn't exist, right? So you can create a connection between two things using code in something like Fusion. And so we can include in the integration logic sort of novel geometry creation as well. Um, and so that gives us the final model, which can then be 3D printed. So we created a library of common <coughs> moves, again, that we found when we looked at how objects were being created, like a bounding box for something, right? So there's a bunch of things on Thingiverse that are basically just using a bounding box for an existing object combined with a, some kind of a tchotchke of some kind, right? And you have an interesting result, like a phone holder. Um, or a scaled mold, which is fitting something more closely and then expanding around it. Um, or a swept path, which can hold a cord, or a connector, which can connect multiple things. Um, and because this is also all hierarchical and it leverages the hierarchy that's also inherent in Fusion, you can now like modify these things and combine them. So this combines a bolt not assembly. This is to go on this uh, pegboard here. And so there's just a bolt that's hooking into these squares, right? With something that is molded around these pens or other objects. And we can swap out one of those without swapping the other pretty easily and change it to something that fits in a drawer and holds these same objects, for example. And we can leverage the object-oriented nature of how these things go together to do that. And so we did a workshop um, and created a model from we asked people to create a model using these things. And had these were never printed by the participants, but four out of the six were able to print 
We also did a comparison between Thingiverse, oh, sorry, between Fusion 360 with and without our tool. And we saw a really big difference in these blue bars are how many of the steps to the final solution that had to be completed that were successfully done with parts versus Fusion. And these were novices in both tools. So just giving you a sense of how that works. When do I need to stop by? I don't want to go over. Um, so there's some people right at one. So, uh, I don't think anyone has a question about that, but I'm having a little bit of time for questions. Okay. I will try to go about five more minutes. Okay. So, what we're seeing here is a kind of expertise ampl amplification that is uh, supported by allowing for reuse of models that are now designed for reuse and that can express, they almost self document, right? You can see where the pipe goes. So, suddenly the model is also more understandable. Um, they can modify the di designs automatically, and they can support non-expert designers. So again, I would argue that we've just touched our toes in the water here with what really needs to be done in this space, right? We need to ideally see the full power of software engineering coming to play in the creation of physical objects. We need the full knowledge that we have around end user programming today to be just as accessible to us and, and be able to build things that are just as accessible to end users. Um, and if we can do that, maybe we can get to the point where we can really see production and personalization of interactive, custom, assistive technology solutions that work for people. So I'm going to rush through this last bit a little bit, but I don't want to stop without at least mentioning the follow-up piece of what we're trying to do, because I think it's really critical. And the reason it's critical is that assistive technology abandonment is really high. Um, depends on the study. I've seen studies that list 75% abandonment, depending on the device, right, down to about 30%, which is actually pretty good for assistive technology. And the kinds of factors that are impacting abandonment remind me a lot of what we think about anyway in HCI, right? The changes in user use or priorities, the ease of obtaining a device, the, the cost of letting it go, kind of, the performance of the device, and the consideration of user needs and priorities. And when we look at a community like Enable, there's almost no data about device use. And I, I helped run one of the first surveys. We sent it to 100 people, and we got zero responses. Zero, right? Um, and we've been working ever since on this problem for a couple of years now. And we finally have a, a pool that participants sign up to when they get devices. They feel some obligation to maybe respond to us. And we're, we designed a survey where we got pretty much zero responses to that, too. And now we're doing phone calls. We're calling them one at a time, and we're asking them what's happening. Right? And the reason that they're not responding is that they're not using the devices in the intended way, if they're using them at all. Sometimes they're using them, but mostly not. What they do is they change people's lives. Right? You're the kid with the cool 3D printed hand for a day. Or they help people realize that there's a solution to their problem that they didn't think of before that they can now create that might not even use the original hand that was given them at all. Or they use it very briefly, and then it breaks down, and they don't have the right connection to a maker to fix it. And so they just move on with their lives, right? And so we're, I haven't published this yet, because we just have like the first five or 10 people's worth of data, and we still have to do the analysis. But it's what we guessed when we were wondering why nobody was filling out this survey. They're hugely grateful to Enable. They don't want to complain about it. But they have a lot to say about what um, they are doing with it and how it's inspiring them that I think Enable can learn from and grow from. Um, and so we are trying to do that we're also trying to look at how can we add tracking to devices. So this is, this is still blue sky, but it was a project using Backscatter to track what was happening with an enable hand. Um, it's just flipping through these. Um, trying to collect mobile data, so using an IMU or some other device to get data, maybe predict abandonment. There's so many open problems here that I don't want to get into in too much depth so that we have time for questions. But I think that if we can start to solve these follow-up problems, as I said, we can maybe predict abandonment, we can trigger follow-up, we can engage people who don't maybe understand the whole process in doing the right things at the right moments in time um, and start to see changes. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, the actuation stuff is about other applications of 3D printing and assistive technology, and so it, it can stand on its own. And I think we're better off having a discussion now. So that concludes what I want to say today. Thank you for listening. Yes. So, <clears throat> kind of looping back to the very beginning where you talked about sort of the high end professional medical stuff and how super certified it has to be and therefore expensive. Um, 
as ideas like this catch on and become more mainstream, mostly what you, I think pretty much all you showed us today were what I would call simple mechanical things. Uh, they may have adjustable parts, but you essentially tighten them up, you do whatever. So I would say, I would guess that someone who's reasonably knowledgeable can look at those things and decide to some degree how safe they might be. When you get to having a computer in them, which of course is what a lot of maker stuff in other spaces has, uh, these are active elements that have computational role. And it seems to me that's, I mean, we know that's a very hard problem. Here's some software, it's supposed to do this. We have no idea what it's gonna do in the edge cases. So how do you see bridging that gap, or do you think the low-hanging fruit, for now at least, is to, to avoid the temptation to put computers in, the, in these devices? And let me give you an example, because if it's a robot, we all understand that. Supposing it's a gripper thing, and the only thing you've done is put a sensor in a computer system which is going to be red and green, and it's telling you whether the thing you're trying to pick up is gripped strongly enough. And the failure mode in that is you're cooking, you've got boiling grease, you pick up the pot because it says green light, and the sensor of the program is wrong, and you <coughs> spill it all over yourself. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so, a um, couple of things about why it's maybe not the first problem to solve, and then we could talk about the problem itself. So, um, a lot of people who use upper limb prosthetics don't use upper limb prosthetics, right? Or they use them, you know, the, the use case of the cello playing is probably one of the best examples we have of actual ongoing use because he needs it to practice the cello, he uses it to practice the cello, he keeps it with his cello, and he doesn't have to worry about wearing this stupid thing when he wants to stick his arm in the mud just like every other kid in his class, right? Um, and, and in fact, um, he was in a classroom where he was expected to spin and knit and draw and do all of these things, and he did them mostly without any prosthetic at all, right? So the, the capability of somebody with upper limb loss tends to be a lot higher than you would expect. And so there's a barrier to getting them to use especially complex, expensive things that we really only saw a few cases where people moved outside that, like the uh, anesthesiologist that was in one of our case studies who had like 12 arms in a bag that he would flip between as he did his job, right, that, where he needed precision and control and they gave that to him. Um, another thing I would say is that there's um, so much work to be done in computational graphics to support design that there's a really nice space for using computation that's quite important that we might start in first before jumping into these more robotic solutions. That said, um, I do think there's a place for those kinds of intelligent devices. Um, we also you know, need to think about really high-end solutions when we think about lower limbs, which is a place where prosthetics are much more likely to be used as well. And I think that um, there's a huge need for thinking about safety and security. And you know, the fail case I was thinking of with your example is the sensor's working fine, but the hand melts a little because the pot's hot, <laughs> right? It's so, there's so many things that can go wrong, and safety is a huge issue in those contexts. And I don't think we have great answers yet there, but I think that, um, it, you know, even just in the realm of robotics, this question of how do you safely interact with a robot is a huge issue, right? And I, I think that if we can draw from some of that knowledge and learn from also solving these problems on body, that there, those advances are worth making. Did that? Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. <clears throat> know yet if I believe that that's the direction that innovation will flow. Um, innovation is already happening in clinical settings. Um, and from what we're seeing, you know, and, and I mean, one of the clinics that, so we did two case studies. One was with three individuals, the other was with two clinics. In the clinic case study, we worked with one clinic that had very, it was very underfunded. I mean, they were using a coffee pot to heat water in which they could soften the plastic that they were using to make braces, right? And the other clinic had 3D printers out the wazoo and didn't quite know what to do with them. So the range of 
uh, context in which people are, people are innovating are enormous. And a, another time I visited the VA in DC, uh, Walter Reed, and they have a full-time mechanical engineer style maker who knows every piece of software and has access to metal printers and plastic printers and everything in between. And he's making like, for people who have double amputations, he's making shorties that they can ice skate in, and, you know, all this stuff. So I think, I think we're gonna see clinically driven innovation that's gonna influence the clinics before we start to see a lot of maker innovation moving into clinical settings. Does that answer your question? Yes. So you've been talking a lot in the sort of really end about the issue of abandonment and all these devices being abandoned, but also mentioned um, cases like where somebody gets a device and then is inspired to find some other solution that works. Um, and I was just wondering, like, doesn't that seem like a success then? Like, didn't the device do its job of solving the problem by inspiring how to do it? Yes. So um, maybe it's just we need, we need to like reframe because abandonment has a really negative value to it. It's like more the question is, are they solving the problem eventually in some way? Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. Uh, um, I don't have enough data yet to be sure that that's the common case, but it, I think it's a very inspirational case, even if it's the exception. Um, and one of the things it points to is the importance of being able to bring that knowledge back into a community like Enable, right? So the, the specific case was a person who had double amputations, and he had two Enable arms that his partner, I forget who, what the relationship was, but she was helping, but it, it, like he had to get somebody else to strap them on, and there was reliability issues and whatever, and so they ended up making this simple thing that went on his arm that had a magnet on it, and then adding magnets to a bunch of things, and he, it was like a, a round hole with a, a, a little bit of a front to it, and so he could just like stick his arm in, put it on himself, get it off himself by like, you know, doing this, right, and then pick anything up and use it, and it, it was such a clever solution, and yet they're the only people who know about it, right, so I, I think... I think that um, if we could start to, to bring that knowledge back, it would be very helpful. Yes? I think I the point you, that you made was that, um, I, I don't know, if you're leveraging or somebody's leveraging these uh, communities of makers who are out there, like, like in the garages and stuff like that, by like going through Thingiverse or something like that and saying, uh, here's a problem that we all like to work on. Uh, I, I, just a clarification, was that something that you were working on? And if not, have you thought about how to uh, leverage those communities, like the potential of those communities that seem to be like ready to do something cool. Yeah, so the, the people who founded Enable, one of them is actually from the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, Ivan Owen and Jennifer Owen were, were two people who were foundational in the creation of Enable, and the others at RIT, or was, he's in Rochester, uh, John Scholl. And they just sort of were like, John had, the, Ivan kind of invented the first Enable arm, and John created it. I took a Google map and said to the community of makers that he was connected to, put a marker if you make one. And that turned into this exponential growth in a Google community. And so, so we've kind of piggybacked on that. So I'm part of the now the governing board to the extent that a grassroots organization that doesn't all even know we exist can have a governing board, right? And part of the follow-up group for Enable to try to kind of study and influence this, like how can you influence this phenomenon to be more user-centered and do follow-up and all of these kinds of things. But it really is something that has grown on its own in this very interesting way that I think as a social scientist who studies online communities, it would be fascinating to study if I were one, right? Um, I have not tried to replicate that with my own work yet. But I'm hoping to eventually like, see if what happens when I push a tool out into that community. Yes? Thanks for your interesting presentation. I'm interested in finding out what any interactions you have with the Paralympics activities that are going on. There's some really novel tools that people are using to engage in sports? No connection at all to Paralympics in particular. I am co-advising a student with Jillian, who's at Irvine, who has been working on paddling systems for the blind. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing a little bit of sports-related stuff there. Yeah. Yes? What do you see as kind of the, the vision here? Like, what, how, how good could it get? You, you, you've looked at a lot of challenges and shown a lot of examples that's a good question. So I think the answer differs depending on what part of the world you're talking about. Um, so in the US, I do think that giving kids superhero arms has its own value briefly. 
that is um, maybe not, I, I don't know how much we're going to get beyond that yet. I, I don't know. I don't know if we'll be able to start seeing better solutions and the, the ways in which it's changing like insurance companies wish to pay prosthetists and other weird things like that is complicated because it's a social technical system that we're influencing here, right? In developing countries, and this is another thing that I, I'm not ready to even publish yet because we're just getting data on it, but we're seeing a really wide variety of socio-technical models for deployment that are involving governments and clinicians in different ways, and we're also seeing values that are less clear cut in the US, like creating something that looks almost like your other limb that lets you kind of pass has a huge amount of value to people. And so there's we're starting to see a shift away from functional arms to mostly aesthetic solutions with like careful attention to skin color and other things like that that look like they might have longer shelf life for people who get them. So um, so there's that's all happening. If we shift away from prosthetic arms and limbs, I think that um, I think that there's an important space in solving problems with orthotics and for people who don't necessarily even identify as disabled, where dissemination is perhaps the biggest problem, where the tools hopefully will get to the point where we can just create solutions, but then we have to think about how we get them out there. Um, so that's, that would be my vision on, on the sort of broader realm of assistive technology is like, can we use a combination of automation, crowdsourcing, and better tool design to make it possible for anyone to solve whatever assistive technology problem they have? And if we can do that, can we get it out there, right? That would be amazing. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.